This is Martin Giles of the Guildford Dragon News, and today I'm with Paul Follows, Councillor Paul Follows, who's the leader of the of Waverley Borough Council. Waverley Borough Council, there's no overall control there, but the Lib Dems have 15 of the 48 seats and have partnered with other partners with other parties to form an administration, while the larger Conservative group, which has 21 seats, um, uh, are the opposition. Welcome to the Guildford Dragon, Paul. First time on the Guildford Dragon for you. Thank you for having me. Hello. And uh, um, now, obviously, Waverley is very similar borough in many ways to Guildford, and you're just to the south of us. There's lots of things in common. But um, why I've invited you for the interview is because you recently cautioned um, Guildford Borough Council against reviewing their local plan. But the Guildford Borough Council has now announced that it is going to go ahead. What is your reaction to that news? And, and do you still think there's a risk that the housing numbers could go up? Well, I think um, the first thing I need to say is that there's a, a, it's very important that we understand what the word review means. Um, and I, I made the point of speaking to the Deputy Leader of Guildford Borough Council this morning to, to, to clarify what review meant. Um, and of course, you could, some people are taking review to be, let's open up the whole local plan, let's take it back to the inspector and see what happens. But actually, review is, is taken to mean exactly how I take it to mean, which is that using the evidence base, they, they commission an informal review of what the numbers would look like if they reopened the plan formally. Um, certainly at Waverley, we, we had a similar manifesto pledge not to reopen the local plan at any cost, but to review its numbers. Um, and when we reviewed the numbers on the, on the current evidence base, because it had changed since we published ours, we realised the numbers would go up staggeringly. And so we decided not to reopen it through that process. So talking to Guildford this morning, it's my understanding that their review to them means exactly the same as it did for me. They'll informally get the numbers checked against the new evidence base and we'll see that number and make a conclusion whether to reopen it formally or not. Um, I understand also the ONS report um, that they're calling for this new evidence base uh, for, for transport and places like town centres and students um, is a draft pretty raw report so I would imagine that everybody's going to wait until there's something a bit more firm to go on. Do you think a, a problem with the local plan process is that it's not flexible enough because the, the, the things are changing so quickly I mean obviously we've had COVID, the COVID pandemic for one thing but there are other factors too that change very quickly and and don't councils need to be more the ability to be more agile with their planning yes i mean the short answer to that is absolutely yes we, we need to because factors those factors change um and as you say they, they change even without larger trends like COVID and and you know people moving in and out of housing of uh, of, of high streets and, and how that works so Yes, it does need to be more, more agile, but I think that the wider problem here is that the whole planning system and planning policy completely restricts local government to actually act in what we believe to be the best interests of our residents in practically every way. The local plan is, is just one expression of those constraints, really. Right. So, so you're the local authorities. Are you saying that local authorities are just left to manage a, a policy that's handed down from the central government? So, I mean, I think that the, the problem I have with, with planning policy as a rule um, is that people assume that local authorities and their local councillors have free reign to say a development's going to go here, it's going to be this high, it's going to look like this. Um, on a basic level, planning policy restrains that. But, but I think in practice, the way that planning policy works we, we can't just decide that we want to build 400 affordable houses here. We can't just decide that we want to build social housing over there or we don't like this development or we don't want to build on the green belt. Effectively speaking, all of the bits that the government doesn't want to take, um, I say credit for, that they don't want to be on the hook for, the unpopular bits, they leave to us by giving us, frankly, the facade of local decision making. But in all meaningful respects, we're subject to national planning policy, national planning rules, a planning inspectorate that follows those rules. Um, and so we end up taking the political can for decisions that are absolutely nothing to do with us. I mean, one of the reasons I stood for Parliament was to challenge those planning rules, because I realised as soon as I got into local government that we were um, effectively being slightly shafted by the government on this. Okay. Now, An Angela Richardson, the Guildford's MP, uh, who 
whose constituency obviously extends down into Waverley Borough, um, she said that that Conservative administration, and she was referring to the 2015 to 19 Conservative Council, did its noble duty in bringing forward the best plan possible. But the fact is that many residents in, in both Guildford and Waverley uh, boroughs are opposed to the scale of the developments in their local plans, aren't they? Especially when it comes to green belt and green space development. Uh, where do you stand on that? Well, I mean, we all, we all know the rumours that certain people were going to get brownie points within the, within the central Conservative Party by pushing through a local plan. Um, my, I mean, local plans aren't going to be popular um, because they effectively force councils to allocate land for housing in most cases that they don't want to. Um, a lot of the issue with it is, is, is releasing greenbelt land um, for development. Nearly everybody in the local government space, and I think that includes the Conservatives too, would prefer to build on brownfield, but it doesn't come up very often. Um, it's, it's owned by other people. Um, and as a result, Greenbelt land and AONB and other things get allocated. And um, what I found since, I mean, I was a backbencher here in 2017 by myself. Um, and since, since sort of moving into a more leadership role here at Waverley, um, actually, you can find brownfield sites if you're prepared to do the legwork and do the work with the owners of those sites and try and bring them forward. They just require more effort than I think that the previous administration at Guildford were willing to put in. Um, one of the Guildford local plan uh, sites that was uh, in one of the original drafts was on the border of my own ward. So my, my, my direct borough council ward is um, up in the centre of Godalming um, and half of it borders on to um, Shackleford. And there was a field bisected right down the middle where the, it's the, the whole field was in the green belt. Our half in Waverley was, uh, was taken out of the green belt by the previous conservative administration here. Thankfully, the new administration dealt with it on the other side um, and, and promised not to re-add it. But, but local plans just inherently problematic because the government forced us to, to, to make these often ridiculous decisions. I mean, the other problem I have is that they don't encourage at any point the right sort of housing because it's just housing without any kind of qualifier to that. Um, is it affordable housing? And by affordable, I mean what a normal person would class as affordable and not what planning policy does. Is it social housing? I mean, what we see in places like Waverley and Guildford is that local plan process enables this proliferation of executive homes that nobody local can afford. On top of that, the way that the infrastructure contributions work is so ridiculous and, and inadequate um, that it will never provide the right sort of support to actually um, to do the job. And that's before you get into housing numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on that. But delivery of the actual housing isn't then the responsibility of the local responsibility of the local authority we're not the developers um, and I would be amazed to see a conservative government actually start finding some developers I know they're saying they're going to but at the end of the day they're, they're big donors aren't they so okay now you've covered a lot of ground there but I just want to zero in on the uh, brownfield development part because it seems to me that it nearly everyone if not everyone thinks that it's a, a sensible idea to develop brownfield before you develop greenfield but it's not as simple as that is it even if, even if the council and the government want to a landowner who owns a brownfield site can just sit on it he doesn't have to develop it absolutely and this is this is often the i mean this is, a, this is actually a, a signifier of one of the larger problems with the planning system the local authority is on the hook for practically everything in the local plan i mean if i go back to the waverley one the local plan is that the authority will deliver 590 houses per annum, which of course is ludicrous because we don't build the houses in the main. I mean, other than a small number of social housing we're able to do ourselves, it relies on developers to, to deliver those numbers. And Brownfield's just the same. If, if nobody wants to bring Brownfield land forward and the owner doesn't want to develop Brownfield land, and, and if we don't already own it as a local authority, it will not come forward. So what that's a done? huge issue. So what should Why be what should they have done? Well, I mean, it depends on each site. I mean, we, we've engaged as much as possible over here. I, I, I really meant that what should yep. central government do? Because shouldn't doesn't it require legislation change? It does. It, it absolutely does. Um, it either needs to incentivize people with brownfield land to come forward, or it needs to actually legally mandate that, that brownfield land is used before greenfield. Um, I mean, and if, that you if, can demonstrate uh, you've used all the opportunities. 
if compulsory purchase was threatened after a period of non-development uh, at a discount, they would they would pretty quickly develop it, wouldn't they? They would. They, I, I think they would. Um, but these are things that just they just will not explore. The so, government so, just will not touch this. So do you, why do you think they won't? Do you think it's because of their relationship with developers or what is it? Well, I, I watched your interview with Angela and uh, and Sir Paul, uh, Sir Paul Beresford and, and, I, and, and the section that you touched on about donors, I think, did strike me because at the end of the day, their party is given a lot of money by developers. Um, and I don't think they do that because they're just lovely, generous people. They expect something from that in the same way that when when trade unions give to the Labour Party, that's because they expect a certain level of policy attitude um, to, to exist. And I, and I think that relationship with developers with the Conservative Party means that they are protected. They are given preferential treatment in the planning system. They are, they are given an out when it comes to um, affordable housing through viability assessments. They are given preferential treatment in terms of infrastructure contributions at the expense of the public. Um, and event, essentially, they are given the ability to have free reign over greenfield and, and prime development land, but not brownfield, in order to build housing we don't really need, which is large executive expensive housing for profit. And you can see by their own profit margins, the developers do very well out of this. I mean, I've sat through probably a good 30, 40 viability assessments where a developer has argued that they shouldn't be building any affordable housing because they're only making an 18% margin on the site. I mean, and that's and that's okay under planning yeah, legislation right, okay. and it's barking <laughs> okay now um isn't it the fact though that the unpopularity of local plans and the planning system if you like uh in guildford and in your uh, borough of waverley an advantage to you actually because it, uh, electorally support is eking away from the conservatives so uh, don't the conserv don't they risk alienating more and more of their traditional supporters in these areas to your advantage? I suppose that's true, and and actually looking at recent electoral history, that does seem to 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 be what's happening. I mean, when you look at the last borough elections across the board in 2019, local plans weighed materially on the outcomes of those elections, and the Conservatives suffered for it. I think we've seen at this last round of county elections, it even bled into that, and it's actually nothing to do with the county elections so if i were a conservative looking at those numbers and looking at the trends over time i'd be wondering what was happening and i'd be sitting there wondering about my mps um because actually it's a bread and butter issue in a place like surrey um about planning and at the moment the conservatives seem to be willfully um aiding developers and ignoring the residents that they say they represent and for surrey you could say the southeast i guess Oh, yes, indeed. I mean, actually, I mean, I, obviously for me, Surrey is where I'm going to know the data most. But from from what I've seen, that is true of most of the southeast of England. Yes. So do you think that uh, some people have said that we've got a sort of reverse thing going on where the Conservatives are forgetting their core support in the south, chasing it in the north, whilst the Labour Party is the reverse? You know, that some of the metro support they're getting is that the well, I don't know if it's at the cost of, but it's going, it's happening whilst at the same time they're, they're losing some of their core support in the north. Yeah, and, and I think that's, um, it's a slight some change in what we would say business as usual for elections over the last couple of years. And, and I think local planning and, and planning policy generally has started to permeate into the public consciousness enough that in the south of England that's having an impact. But surely this is a huge opportunity for the Lib Dems. But, no, it is. It is. <laughs> but what? But they won't. They need to change some of their policies in order to take advantage of it. Well, I don't think so. I mean, realistically, we we've always been arguing for a planning system that actually represents the. Well, not just planning, of, but not just planning. Not I mean, in general, of, of it na nationally, won't you have to shift some of your policies to have a wider wider support? Well, a lot, some potentially, but but we're more of a values based organisation. And actually, I think people do tend to respond to that. I mean, from my own personal view, um, I'm well known for being an advocate of um, progressive alliance type activities. And, and I think working together with other parties is, is where the future lies um, for us. And um, certainly it's something I try and do over here. And we're, we're a cross party coalition of Greens, Labour, Liberal Democrats and residents over in Waverley. And okay, wouldn't, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that require uh, an adoption of 
proportional representation until that truly comes to pass. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the holy grail would be having a, a, the abolition of first past the post, which just generally brings out um, inequality everywhere that it sits. Okay. I mean, you've got a government that's got, what, 58% of the seats in the House um, and in the Commons with 43% of the vote. It it's usually brings out unequal, unequal results. OK, now back to local issues then. So um, Joss Bigmore, your counterpart at Guildford Borough Council, has said that both GBC and Waverley Borough Council are exploring more ways of cost-cutting partnerships and other joint working, I think, um, including the sharing of services. Can you put a bit more meat on the bone there? What is being explored? Well, um, as you know, um, central government have practically eliminated any central funding for local authorities. Um, and so we are compelled really at this point to start finding um, different ways to try and save money. Um, but I think really what we also want to do is if we are gonna do any kind of shared working, shared staffing structures, um, we need to see if we can actually make services better or different um, as part of that. So um, in terms of putting meat on the bones, I have to be a little bit careful because we're, we're still going through discussing what some of these things are. OK, um, so it's no subject to, to negotiation. I, I don't want and I certainly wouldn't want to panic people who work for those authorities. But I think the thing I would stress is that it isn't just about the financial drivers. I mean, we really want to make sure that anything we do as a, as a partnership is, is greater than the sum of our parts. So that there's actually something meaningful for residents out of it too, not just cost cutting for the sake of it. Okay. But I mean, these uh, such mergers don't always produce the savings that, that are envisaged or hoped for, do they? No, no, they don't. And that's why Firstly, we need to make sure that it is analysed properly and fully in detail before anybody makes any decisions about anything. Um, but it is also making sure that we understand what we want to do next in terms of service delivery, because we need to we need to make it work. OK, so from what you're saying, it, it sounds like it's still relatively early days and there's still a lot of exploration and negotiation going on. We're in we're into the detail now, I would say it's, it's the, the, the principle of what we're doing has been understood by both sides of the equation, uh, but it's just making sure that there is a business case um, to do what we're doing. And when will things be made a bit more public? I would imagine probably within the next oof, month or so into, into the early part of July, I think it will be a bit more clear. OK, thank you. Now, how often so how often do you talk to Joss Bigmore? It, do you talk to him regularly on this particular subject or because you're neighbouring council leaders, do you talk a lot anyway? I think with, with Guildford being so close and us sharing so many of the same issues, um, we all speak quite a lot, actually. Um, we do meet on this particular subject of, of, of shared working with, with Guildford, obviously, but um, we do speak on all sorts because everything impacts us. Um, usually if it's a Surrey thing, it impacts us both in, in, in a similar way. So, um, yeah, so I speak to Guildford most, most days. Most days, you speak well, to most, one, one, of, one, of, one or more of the Guildford executives, certainly I'll speak to most days on something, yeah. Okay, um, and what about the unitary authority idea? Obviously, we've been told it's been kicked into the long grass, at least the single unitary authority. Most people I've spoken to are not against the idea per se. They just didn't like the, or at least a lot of people didn't like the single unitary proposal. What, what's your view? Well, I mean, I'm not against the concept per se, because I think actually the fragmentation of local government, other than being complicated and confusing for residents, um, doesn't, um, it has less large issues in terms of, of, of using the money effectively. I mean, in most parts of Waverley and Guildford, there are two or three tiers of local government, and that's a lot for residents to get around. It's a lot even for councillors to get around on occasion. Um, so I don't disagree with the principle of it. What I do did disagree with um, was firstly a unitary of 1.2 million people. I mean, that would be just nightmarish in terms of representation of residents' actual views. Um, I'm one of those people that's more inclined to, to make services as local as possible because it means that people can actually see them and comment and, and, and understand them better. And that's um, and also, a good um, principle. Well, it? to be fair, it's a Lib Dem principle, but it's also a principle of most of the, 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 the progressive centre of the country um, to, to make these things more accessible to the residents that are paying for them. It's, a, for me, a, a fairly basic and reasonable principle. And the other thing as well is that um, 
Surrey is quite remote um, and, and 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 really people it's just too detached from from the daily lives of, of people. I mean, uh, the idea that decisions on the local level in Godalming would be made out of Rygate um, by somebody who's probably never even been there for me just it doesn't make sense. Um, what I would say is that I keep get, hearing rumblings that that this is temporarily dead. Um, I, the reasons I'm getting for that are just quite how many conservative districts and boroughs were opposed to the idea as well, um, as, as well as uh, non-Tory boroughs like Waverley and Guildford. Um, and it might not come back for a while. I mean, I would be very disturbed if it did come back, because, of course, if Surrey were genuinely committed to it, Surrey Conservatives were generally committed to it, it should have been a manifesto pledge during the election we've just had. So if it does come back, I think it, would, it doesn't have a mandate from the people of Surrey. Um, and we would again fight it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? That in the in the county council election, it was planning, even by the you know the, the MPs uh, in this area have said it was planning that was the issue. N none of the county council issues. I mean, uh, the big budget items in county council, of course, are social care, and that hardly yeah. got a mention. I mean, to be honest, I was quite frustrated actually during the during the county campaign just how. Um, how much of the Surrey issues were, were actually put on the back burner by everybody and um, uh, focusing on planning, as you say, but, but also some of the national stuff too. I mean, you've got adult social care, you've got highways, you've got a colossal Surrey budget deficit, you've got a, an Ofsted report that, that got very conveniently delayed for the election um, on their children's Well, they, they, to I mean, be fair, they said that that was Ofsted that delayed it and not them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that was the case. Um, but either way, nobody discussed really any of these core issues and actually I don't recall having a conversation about the unitary debate with nearly anybody during the election um, and they certainly did their level best not to talk about it too um, so a lot of these issues with Surrey especially their budget um, didn't ever get addressed by anybody and I think in the long run that's going to be a problem. Okay well Councillor Follows, thank you very much for giving your time for this interview. Yep. I found it interesting. I hope our readers do too. Uh, and I and hopefully in the future we may come back and speak to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Bye.